Hello, and thank you for joining us on this discussion on the latest and greatest technologies and techniques in orthoplasty or joint replacement surgery. My name is Tad Grillinger. I'm an orthoplasty surgeon here at Rush uh, University Medical Center. I practice as Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. I'm an associate professor at Rush, and I'm also the director of our adult reconstructive fellowship. Um, what I want to discuss with you tonight is a couple of things that I really enjoy about uh, what I do, which is primarily hip and knee replacement. Um, one of the topics that comes up, questions I get from patients routinely is, is about partial knee replacement. You know, what is a partial knee? Am I indicated for it? Who should get a partial knee replacement? Why should I get one if it's the rest of the knee is going to wear out? Those sorts of things. And I, I will tell you that we're, we're come to a point where uh, partial knee replacement really rivals total knee replacement in its longevity and function. Uh, and we also know now that patient satisfaction or how well they like their knee is significantly higher with the partial. Um, it's uh, great to be here at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Our founding father, uh, George Galante, uh, was actually responsible for designing the very first, I would consider modern, uh, we call fixed bearing partial knee replacement. Uh, and uh, it's from that that a lot of the designs have evolved, including the current design that, that I utilize. And so it's kind of a nice legacy here at, at Rush that, that these partial knee replacements um, essentially founded in its, count, in its uh, most current form by our founder, have now passed on you know, a couple generations later. I've been doing orthoplasty for 20 years now, and um, I really was uh, excited about partial knee replacements that I think I've ever been, and it probably accounts for uh, 25 or 30 percent of my knee replacements. So what is a partial knee replacement? Well, partial knee replacement is for knees that only wear out either the medial or lateral compartment of the knee, and also the telephermal joint, which is behind the kneecap, if they're worn out in isolation, uh, those can be replaced individually. The advantage of that is you can maintain the knee almost in a, in a standard state other than that resurfacing of the compartment that's worn out. Uh, most commonly, this is the medial compartment or the very inside of your knee. For folks that look a little bow-legged, uh, that's what, the, what that is uh, usually related to. Um, or you have a meniscal tear when you're young and you have that scoped out after an athletic injury. And then eventually you go on to wear it on that inside. Um, this is routinely done as a same day operation. Uh, you can have it done in our surgery centers. You can have it done overnight in the hospital if your medical uh, conditions require that. But uh, routinely these uh, patients are walking in at three weeks better than they were when they walked in. Uh, and uh, pain medication requirements are gone. Never using, almost never using any sort of assistive device. Very fast recovery. We maintain the ACL, the PCL, the collateral ligaments, and the rest of the native knee is your own. And that creates the most normal feel and therefore the highest satisfaction uh, when it comes to functional satisfaction for knee replacement compared to a knee replacement, totally replacement surgery. So it's a um, uh, really, I think, a very, uh, a really good option for folks whose knee is suitable for just a partial. Brings up another topic that people ask about a same day surgery. You know, am I a candidate for same day surgery? Well, depending on um, your medical problems, we call your comorbidities, your other medical issues, uh, you may very well be. And I think that we're starting to establish that um, certain comorbidities even can be you know, taken into account and still be done on a same day basis. Uh, we're doing these more and more often, um, uh, particularly here in Illinois and Indiana at ambulatory surgery centers, which actually requires patients to not even really come into the hospital. It's a surgery center, you come in for surgery there a few hours, you see the therapist afterwards, they train you up to get you safely uh, home with your loved one, and then you can do your recovery uh, partially at home, and then obviously with the assistance of a therapist on an outpatient basis. This is a nice option, particularly uh, in the days of, of the current virus uh, pandemic, because you're not coming in where, where uh, the patients with COVID are. Um, the staff is screened routinely, uh, temperature checks, pulse checks, uh, pulse oximetry checks or your oxygenation level. Um, we look at you know, travel history, everyone gets screened every day, and certainly the healthcare providers are all um, are all very cautious about exposing patients. And I'm not aware of a single case that's been transferred to uh, any elected patient. Um, so I think that this these service centers provide a nice option. Brings up another topic, I, I mentioned the word elective. Um, I think that gets confused with uh, elective somehow is not essential. Um, I would suggest the leptus means it can be scheduled. Uh, I have plenty of arthritis patients who would consider their surgery essential. Uh, and right after COVID hit, we had several 
patients that were seriously disabled. Now they're locked in the house, unable to move, pain increasing, can't exercise, can't do the things that uh, help them relieve their symptoms. And these patients became very significantly affected by arthritis to the point where I think that is an essential operation. Uh, pain can lead to the essential need for an operation uh, to keep someone's life uh, intact. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, should you be concerned about COVID? Yes, we're all concerned but with appropriate precautions and done the way surgery is being done currently with appropriate precautions. I'm very confident in our, in our team here at Rush, very confident in our surgery centers that uh, my partners and I at Midwest Orthopedics uh, where we do surgery. Um, and I think that we've got some very nice precautions in place that you know, allow me to go to work every day um, and um, uh, safely, you know, do what I need to do to, to take care of you. Um, we're going to take some questions now, and I think we have um, uh, some questions coming in. This first question is, how do I know when it's time? Well, surgery is, is serious, and yes, arthroplasty surgery is considered elective surgery. And I mentioned that some people that becomes essential surgery when they're limited by pain, their quality of life is impacted. So my suggestion is, yes, you should try the non-operative measures, which are routine, like you know, weight loss if you're overweight, activity modification, strengthening, maybe the therapy or exercise, anti-inflammatory medications, sometimes injections, particularly for knees, are all needed. But should you attempt these non-operative measures, continue to have symptoms, specifically when they interfere with your quality of life and your ability to earn a living if, if you're you know, still working, um, those things become obviously, I think, a necessity at that point. So I always tell people, you know, if I was going to miss a single, you know, vacation with my family or something that I enjoy that, that really provides me with my quality of life due to limitations from arthritis, I think we're to the point where arthroplasty surgery is so successful that um, I think that, uh, you know, when, when done safely um, with appropriate precautions for medical conditions, that uh, I wouldn't hesitate. I wouldn't miss a single, wouldn't miss a single ski season with mine. So the next question came in, what is recovery like for total hip replacement? Well, I think that now, particularly in patients that are suitable for outpatient surgery to be done at the surgery centers, um, you come in that day, um, you go home with probably crutches, you spend a little bit, a few days recovering, pain control, getting a jump on healing, you go to outpatient therapy, and routinely patients are walking in at the three-week mark for the first visit with me, have the wound check and all. And they're walking in, no assistive devices. They might limp a little still, depending on how long you were limping before you came in for surgery. But all in all, pain med requirements are almost non-existent. And I, I like to say that I think that the, with the pain relief, you've got probably better than you started, uh, you know, three weeks later. Uh, six weeks with the metal healed into what we routinely use now is pressed fit implants, ones that aren't cemented in. Uh, they tend to last longer. So that first six weeks, I, I prefer to limit some activities just to make sure we get a good uh, solid healing. But at six weeks, you know, I release you to do whatever it is you want to do. And really the length of time to return to your normal, which are activities that you want to return to, is probably more related to how long you were disabled and getting weaker than it is you know, with the uh, actual surgery. Another question, uh, this comes up routinely in clinic, You know, posterior versus anterior approach. There uh, are a hundred ways to throw a fastball uh, or a strike, I'm sorry, in baseball, you know, Commenting to the latest uh, World Series uh, uh, championship here, the um, anterior versus posterior approach. There are surgeons that do both very well. Um, there's there was a hype around anterior approach. I think that uh, was advertised a fair bit, but I think the data is out there now that uh, an anterior approach can carry some additional risk. There appears in some studies to be a high risk of failure. Uh, so I would suggest uh, my uh, what I would do as a patient. I would select my surgeon. A good track record, high volume, meaning lots of lots of surgeries, uh, and a high volume center that's there for a customer to take care of those patients, and that's probably more important than dictating or trying to uh, pick the approach. Uh, there are surgeons that make a posterior approach or a mini posterior approach, or a version of an anterior approach. Great, the direct anterior is the one that gets advertised to fit. But I'm sure there's guys, uh, surgeons, I'm sorry, that, that do that quite well. But I think that. Um, uh, you choose your surgeon, discuss it with them, and they will choose the technique that they feel is best for you. Um, I don't think that there's great data that any one lasts longer, has greater function, and even the recoveries, I think, at the three-week mark, there's, there's, no, there's not really no difference. Next question came in, can I run with a partial? So it's a good question. Running with 
joint replacements in general, uh, was always kind of historically discussed in the terms of, hey, it's an artificial joint, and like a car tire, you potentially could wear it out with use. That is theoretically true. But when we came to look at some of the data, and uh, uh, some surgeons uh, look, took a look at, does high-level like sports activities, athletic activities, truly impact longevity? There's actually no data that that's true. Um, and along the same lines, or in the same time frame, we've now improved the materials to an extent now that you know the FDA is allowing a certain needs to be called 30-year needs. Uh, we're using ceramics more often, at least on the head surface of a hip replacement, and how they cross in polyethylene or the latest version of the very fancy plastic we use to line the joints, the wear surface, the tire, so to speak. Uh, and those plastics are showing very, very, very low rates of wear just compared to historical. So I would tell you that, um, A, I, I want people to go back to doing what it is that they enjoy. That's the whole point of having surgeries, returning to the functions that provide you joy or your quality of life. B, with the newest materials and the latest techniques, I think that, uh, that you can safely return to those activities, uh, specifically for partial, because the surface area there, I do like people to rest, heal appropriately. Everyone heals at a different uh, rate but make sure that bone is good and strong to support that person before you're running on it. So I, I usually tell people three months to run. Now you can walk, bike, bike, swim, ski, uh, play golf. But as far as repetitive impact activities, my personal preference is three months. We don't have great data on that. Some may tell you sooner, some may tell you later. But I think the bottom line is returning your, to your favorite activities is absolutely a possibility and it is encouraged, at least in my practice, uh, with hip, knee, uh, partial knee replacement surgery. Next question, I need two hips replaced. How does that work? Well, I think that with uh, hip replacements, and I would, I would even venture to say with knee replacements, my preference is do one, optimize the outcome, take the time it takes to do separate surgeries, recover. I'll do them as soon as six weeks apart, so I think you can get some strength back, recover well, your body's ready for a second operation, and that way we can optimize the result. Uh, you know, and technically with hips, you know, putting you on your side, uh, doing two at once, that's a lot. And that's uh, potentially makes it hard to recover from anyone fully. So I prefer to do them one at a time. There's also some other risks associated with prolonged surgery time that I think um, aren't necessarily, um, you know, worthwhile. Uh, and routinely, actually, with patients, particularly with bilateral knee replacements and with hips, you do one side. And because you've got a good hip on or knee on one side, that you don't feel the symptoms quite as badly on the other side. And so that may allow you to time it better with work and time off and, and social things, family things, that I think is a little more convenient and safer overall. Next question is, how long does pain last after total knee replacement? Good question. So I think pain is, everyone is different, first of all. There's no, if your neighbor had it one way and was told you that they're, you know, free of pain in a day and you, you know, some another person says they took a month, everyone is a little bit different. I think that's, uh, it's ref um, affected by a number of things. Number one, how bad is the deformity? How long have you had the pain? You know, how big of an operation would it be? You know, if you've had end-stage arthritis for a year, you've only been, you know, significantly impacted for six months uh, from this and limited, you're going to recover a lot faster than someone who comes in and has been limping for 10 years, say, and has even that much more bone loss, that much more wear, that much longer of an operation, technically difficult operation. A person may last a little longer, but I will tell you, their pain may last a little longer, but I'll tell you, you know, routinely now with our modern pain protocols, particularly folks that we can do as an outpatient surgery, um, it's not unusual uh, for three uh, three weeks, no pain requirement. Um, and uh, I'd say that's actually more the, more the, the norm than, than um, any exception. Next question, how long will a total hip last me? I would say, and I think with the modern materials, ceramics, some of the uh, ceramicized metal heads, uh, some of the sophisticated bearing surfaces we have now. I don't think it's a stretch to say it'll last you a lifetime. Um, with modern polycrossing polyethylene, the, routine, the liner we routinely use, most commonly used surface for the lining of the hip, we're not seeing the, where we used to see with the old polyethylene of you know, the old plastic of 30 years ago. So I think it's safe to say, uh, and it can depend on age, can depend on activity level, but I've got folks who are back running, a patient who's, who's big goals to get back to running on the Chicago Marathon. And she was in her, uh, was very young. So um, she ran a half marathon, came to visit, was doing great, and is, was set up to do the marathon this year, which unfortunately didn't, didn't, didn't happen, but she'll be ready for the next one. And 
uh, I wanted to enjoy her life. Um, at that, you know, in your early, in your late twenties, early thirties, you probably should get more routine surveillance to double check and make sure you're not. But we're, we're not seeing the wear those uh, days of old. I'll tell you, go back, do what you want. There's a very good chance you'll never get another operation. Next question: I've had an ACL tear. Am I more likely to, to meet to need a partial or a full knee replacement? So the ACL uh, is actually necessary for a partial knee replacement to be successful. So um, there are cases, there is some data that suggests that even ACL torn knees, ACL deficient knees, as we call them, can still be indicated for a partial knee replacement, but it needs to be what we call a clinically stable knee. So if you have any sort of functional instability and you feel like your knee is unstable or it gives up, you're probably not going to be a candidate for a partial, but what's nice is the total knee will give you that stability back. In rare cases, we actually can do a combined ACL reconstruction with a partial knee replacement. Um, and now it could be done in conjunction with my sports partners who routinely do the ACL reconstructions. But that's in special patients. Um, and uh, I think that that'll end degrees, it depends on the degree of arthritis in the rest of the day. So uh, can it be done? Yes. Can you be, frankly, ACL deficient and get a partial? Sometimes. Um, but more likely than not, you're going to need to. Next question, what is minimally invasive joint replacement? So minimally invasive surgery was something that, um, you know, came, uh, became popular 15 years ago when I came to Rush to learn it. Uh, it, being, it was being pioneered here by one of my senior partners, uh, outpatient surgery uh, and has become you know, more commonly accepted and also kind of what people are striving for these days. So I think that that was disrupted, disruptive uh, advancement done here uh, and my partner Rich Berger 15 years ago, um, 16 years ago is when I when I trained and, and he started it before that. So I think that that's really been a um, uh, a big, big, big advancement. I think now we realize that it's not just the surgery, the incision length, but it's how you handle soft tissues, meticulous surgical dissection, minimally disrupting tissues, minimally damaging tissues, being meticulous with the approach. But that's in conjunction with early rehabilitation, patient education on expectations, better anesthetic techniques and pain techniques. Um, and it requires an entire team for that, a multi, with a multimodal approach to joint replacement. Um, but that in combination with the lesser invasive operation, people recover faster, they can go home same day, something that was unheard of you know, 20 years ago. Next question, how do I choose the best surgeon for me? Well, I think that you need to, my suggestion, if we have data that says that higher volume surgeons uh, doing you know a lot of joint replacements in higher volume hospitals, places where they do a lot of joint replacement, have better results. So I think that um, you need to you know take a look. I would look for a highly rated hospital, highly rated surgeon, uh, match those two up, and then you know take a look at their approach and their philosophy. Luckily, with these days of social media and websites, you know you can find out the philosophy of just about every surgeon how they handle surgical patients, how they handle joint replacement on their own, on their website, or certainly call their office. And don't be afraid to, you know, quote unquote, interview the surgeon. You know, you go for a visit, uh, happens all the time, I get a second opinion, they want to hear how I would do their surgery. Um, a lot of times I get, wow, I didn't even get offered the partial knee replacement at my first surgeon, because not every surgeon does partials, and something that, that I, I like very much, I published a book this year on it. Um, uh, was it help to a design of the latest model, the one that I use? So I'm actually pretty passionate about parcels for the appropriate patient. What is the recovery time? That's the next question. Recovery time, partial versus total. So partial knee replacement does recover a little faster. Um, uh, at the three-week mark, routinely, parcels are walking in and are better than they were when I met them. Totals, depending on the amount of deformity, you know, how much, you know, if you couldn't get it straight to, before you met me, if you have a badly bow leg or, or knock knee, getting that correct, it requires a lot of work. And that's what means you have to get the total versus the partial. So by definition, a knee that's worse, has worse arthritis, more pervasive arthritis, that's going to be someone that requires a total knee replacement. So almost by definition, those people are probably going to recover a little bit slower. Now, can you still walk in a three weeks? Certainly, I have people that routinely do that. But rarely do we see any assistive devices, crutches, or cane, or walker at three weeks. And even with total knees, you know, not a lot of pain medication medication requirements after that. So it still can be done. Total knees can still be done same day. You can still go direct, directly to outpatient therapy. You can be back in the office in a couple of weeks if they're on the type of job, the type of job you may have. 
So, but it's still overall a little bit, a little bit slower. And I think it's primarily because by definition, your knee was worse before we started. Next question. How soon can I go back to work after a total neuropathy? Interesting. I just uh, last last Friday operated on an anesthesiologist uh, friend of mine who um, I'd done his previous knee about six months ago, and he was back. He took one week off and was back doing anesthesia in a hospital full time on, on week two. I think he would agree that was probably a little aggressive. Although he told me he's going to do the same thing after this knee that we just did a second his other side. Uh, I would suggest, I personally would take probably two weeks off to get a jump on healing after totaling arthroplasty before I came back and saw patients in the office. You know, if I was doing manual labor, I was on my feet all day, didn't have the ability to sit or rest if I needed to, uh, you're going to need a little bit longer. And again, it depends on how bad the knee was before you started. If you were limping around for 10 years and you expect to go back to climbing ladders and, and uh, working as a pipe fitter, you know, that's probably going to need a little bit more time to recover someone that can be in an office and that, but I would say at the minimum a week off, two is probably a little more ideal, and then depending on what your work entails. Next question. So I think we're running out of time. That's the cue. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in here. Uh, I recommend that uh, you do take a look at uh, myself and my partners if you're considering joint replacement. I've got uh, fantastic partners. Um, and take a look. Everyone does things a little bit differently, but they, I would let anyone operate on me. We've got some of the best uh, with big surgeons, I think, in the world here at Midwest, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. You can find us on the RushOrtho.com website, uh, and um, uh, I encourage you to uh, you know, not don't consign yourself to live with arthritis pain, as particular the hip or the knee. There are great solutions out there and restoring your function. And the most common comment I get after hip or knee replacement is, "I wish I wouldn't have waited so long." That kind of makes me feel a little bad because for some reason people think it's going to take forever to recover or there's risks, uh, particularly in these days of COVID when we're all sh shut up inside and having to quarantine, not being able to exercise or go for a walk. Uh, I think that that's, that's tragic. So we're doing it safely here at Rush, taking every precaution, and I would encourage you that if you are being disabled by hip or knee arthritis, it's impacting your quality of life to, to see, at least seek an opinion. And we can do these on telemedicine these days too if you're really concerned about coming in and I, what I've said hasn't reassured you with the precautions we have. We can do these via telemedicine these days. I routinely see folks uh, from tele, uh, via telemedicine and, and from all states and they so that are coming up here when the time is right. So it's been a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank our, our team here helping us put this together tonight and um, I wish you a good evening.